Occupational English Test. Listening Test. This test has three parts. In each part you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Pamela Erickson. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, doctor, I have itchy red rash on my feet. Okay. What's your age? 21, doctor. Tell me if you have developed any associating symptoms or signs. It is tingling persistently, doctor. Since how long have you had this problem? For the past four weeks. Exactly on which part of your foot you are getting this problem? Right great toe, right second toe, right third toe, and right fourth toe. Often the onset of itching starts after removing sweaty socks. Do you drink or smoke? I do not smoke, but I do drink. Have you had any diseases in the past? Well, I had chicken pox and frequent ear infections. You had any surgeries as well? I have surgical ear tubes. Do you take any medications? No, doctor. Are you allergic to any medicine or substances? Well, I get a severe rash when I access adhesive tape. Any of your family members have any history of illness? My paternal grandmother is having cataracts, and my maternal aunt has migraines. Well, your physical examination reports show blood pressure 110 over 64, respiratory rate is 18, heart rate is 66, and temperature is 98.6. Lower extremities is warm to cool. Proximal to distal. The dorsalis pedis artery pulse palpable bilateral. Posterior tibial artery pulse palpable bilateral. No edema observed. Varicosities are not observed. Right great toe, right second toe, right third toe, and right fourth toenail show erythema and scaling. Muscle strength is 5 out of 5 for all groups tested. Muscle tone is normal. Inspection and palpation of bones, joints, and muscles is unremarkable. You have developed tinea pedis, a fungal culture of skin from right toes. KOH test shows no visible microbes. I am prescribing Lotrimin AF 1% cream to apply four times a day. And Griseofulvin 250 milligrams PO once in eight hours for four weeks. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a doctor talking to a recently admitted patient called Roy Miller. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. So, Roy, I see from your notes you've been admitted because of shortness of breath. Can you tell me more about that, please? 
Yeah, uh, well, it started last week. I noticed that getting up the stairs was more of an effort, and I found that I had to pause on the way to catch my breath. Right. Uh, I did used to get a little out of breath, but it's definitely gotten worse. I normally manage to go shopping with my wife, and we walk to the shops and back. I generally have to have a, a little rest, but now everything is just taking me longer. I feel weary, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've got this cough. It's like a, a barking thing that I, I just can't shift. It's worse at night when I'm lying down and I get a bit wheezy. I'm just really tired because it keeps me awake for most of the night. My wife has been sleeping in the spare room because it's keeping her awake. I've also sort of been bringing things up when coughing. Um, without being too graphic, it's, it's quite thick. Uh, it's a sort of dirty green color, I suppose. Right. It, it wasn't like that at the beginning of last week. It, it was just clear. But over the last couple of days, I've noticed it's changed color, and I'm coughing up a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife was starting to get worried, so she made me an appointment with our doctor, and then he sent me here. Okay, well... Do you have any other symptoms? Yeah, I was really hot yesterday, and I thought it was because the heating was on, but my wife hadn't turned it on. Then the next minute I was shivering. I guess I'm feverish. It sounds like you've been really suffering. Yeah. Have you got any other medical conditions? Well, I was diagnosed with this lung condition last year. Uh, I've forgotten the name of it. Uh, hold on. Um, CO, CO, uh, hang on, I'll, I'll get it. Uh, COPD, is that it? Yeah. Well, um, anyway, they told me that my lungs weren't working as well as they could be because I used to be a smoker. Right. But I quit about six years ago. To be honest, I think it was because I worked in the mines and it was really dusty. Either way, I've got it and it makes me a bit breathless, but nothing like this. Right. Uh, and I also get gout from time to time, and I take something called allopurinol or something. Uh, I've also got arthritis in my knees, but that's just because of my age, so <laughs> I just put up with that. You mentioned taking allopurinol. Mm -hmm. Are you on any other medication? Well, uh, the doctor gave me inhalers, and I'm using those. Mm -hmm. I'm getting better at taking them because I found it a bit confusing at first. Um, I've started to take my blue inhaler a lot more over this last week because I've been so breathless. I take the stuff I mentioned before, uh, a statin for my cholesterol, and then the odd paracetamol when my arthritis starts to play up. I don't really like taking pills, but if it keeps me going, then it's worth it. Uh, also, I'm allergic to penicillin. I get an awful rash all over my body, and it's so itchy whenever they give it to me. Don't give me any of that. We won't, Roy. You mentioned you live with your wife. Are you both managing at home? Oh, yeah. Um, we still get around the town to get our shopping and see the family. The stairs are starting to get a bit much now, so we're thinking about moving into a bungalow, but we haven't started looking yet. Okay, that's good. Have you got any ideas as to what might be going on? Uh, well, I think it might be a chest infection because it's just getting worse. I just want to start feeling better. Of course, Roy. It, it does sound like that might be the case, but we'll start doing some tests to make sure and begin treatment. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a doctor explaining to his patient about a bone marrow biopsy. Doctor, I was told to undergo a bone marrow biopsy and I'm very worried about this test. Can you suggest how I need to prepare for this? Well, a bone marrow biopsy is normally advised to diagnose and monitor a variety of conditions.
it can also be performed to diagnose or determine the extent of certain types of cancer. A bone marrow biopsy is performed through the procedure called a bone marrow aspiration to obtain a sample of the bone marrow, which is the blood forming portion of the inner core of the bone. Usually, a bone marrow aspiration is taken from the pelvic bone called the ilium. That can be accessed from the lower back near the hip. The sample can also be taken from the centre bone in the chest called the sternum or the front of the pelvic bone near the groin. Question 26. You hear two hospital managers talking about an information session for people who want to do voluntary work. So, how's the planning going for the future volunteer information evening? Well, we've had a lot of RSVPs already, so I'm really happy with the way the event management systems have worked. Having a bit of trouble sourcing some good catering, though. Considering that these people are freely giving their time to come and learn what is expected, I really want to provide some nice food and refreshments for them. Have uh, you got any contacts you like using? Yeah, look, that's right. It's a small thing we can do for those participants. I'll tell you what. I'll ask around my team for some recommendations for something a bit special. Great, thanks. I really appreciate it. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a doctor on different categories of chemotherapy drugs. Hello, doctor. What are the different categories of chemotherapy drugs? There are several types of chemotherapy drugs that vary both in their functioning and on which part of the cell cycle they work. Alkylating agents are nonspecific drugs that directly damage DNA. Examples include cytoxin and myloran. Antimetabolites work by pretending they are nutritional sources for the cell. Cancer cells take up these drugs instead of nutrients and essentially starve to death. Examples include navelbine, VP16, and Gemzar. Plant alkaloids include drugs obtained from plant sources. Examples include cosmogen and mutamycin. Anti-tumor antibiotics differ from the types of antibiotics used to treat bacterial infections. These drugs work by preventing cancer cells from reproducing. Examples include adriamycin and cerubidine. Question 28. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Now read the question. Doctor, what are the various types of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? There are different kinds of functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Gastrinoma usually forms in the head of the pancreas and sometimes forms in the small intestine. Most gastrinomas are malignant. Insulinoma forms in the head, body, or tail of the pancreas. Insulinomas are usually benign. Glucogenoma forms in the tail of the pancreas. Most glucogenomas are malignant. VIPomas, which make vasoactive intestinal peptide. Somatostatinomas, which make somatostatin. Question 29. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining about gall stones. Now read the question. Gallstones are formed due to an imbalance in the composition of bile, resulting in hard stones that are made of pigment or crystallized cholesterol, or a mixture of the two. They can range in size from as small as a sand grain to as large as a tennis ball. One can have a single large gallstone, dozens to hundreds of smaller gallstones, or a combination of both small and large stones. There are two types of gallstones. Typically, patients with pigment stones have cirrhosis of the liver, biliary tract infections, and hereditary blood disorders, including sickle cell anemia. These are all conditions that produce too much bilirubin, of which the stones are made of. Pigment stones tend to be dark brown or black. Cholesterol stones are formed as a result of bile that is made of too much cholesterol or bilirubin and not enough bile salts. They can also form when the gallbladder fails to empty during the digestive process. 
they are usually yellow-green gallstones, which are the most common type. Question 30. You hear a doctor briefing the junior doctors about trigger point injection. Now read the question. Trigger point injection. Often muscle spasm prolongs and doesn't respond to regular treatments like ice and heat, physiotherapy, or muscle relaxants. In order to relax the muscle, either a local anesthetic or a combination of local anesthetic medication and a steroid medication will be injected into the tight bundle of muscles known as trigger points. In this process, the skin of the patient will be cleaned and chlorhexidine and a small needle will be inserted into the trigger point muscle. Generally, up to four trigger points are injected in one session. However, when injecting up to 10 trigger points, the patient will feel very painful. It is essential for the patient to inform the physician when the needle contacts the painful trigger point as this is where the medicine has to be injected. They may feel a temporary discomfort. There can be many possible complications after a trigger point injection, including mild bleeding and skin irritation and infection. Although the positive result of the treatment cannot be ascertained, the local anesthetic will numb the area for three hours. The corticosteroids remain in the tissue in active form for about one month. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear a veterinarian called Dr. Han Philip giving a presentation. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Hi, I'm Dr. Han Philip. First of all, thank you everyone for coming here, tonight. Dogs can have a variety of back or spinal diseases and injuries, slipped or protruding discs are very well known in longer back breeds of dogs like Dachshunds for example. But, a disease you may not have heard of can be very devastating and I have an interesting case to show you. The disease is called Wobbler's Syndrome. Tucker is a three-year-old rescued dog, who is very loved by his adoptive family. He is a Great Dane, but because he's adopted from a rescue, the family did not know anything about his medical history or breeding. However, at about eight months after coming home, Tucker began showing some very subtle signs of lack of coordination and slipping on tile floors. Then one evening in normal play, he yelped out with severe pain in his neck. The next day, routine X-rays of the neck revealed a suspicion of a cervical malformation in the last three neck vertebrae. He was sent to a specialist in neurology for an exam and even an MRI, exactly as we have in human hospitals. It was done under a general anesthetic. The MRI shows very clearly three cervical vertebrae that are thickening and pressing inward on the spinal cord. 
This is called spinal stenosis and it will cause slow progression of weakness and therefore the name wobbler's syndrome, and eventually it will cause paralysis and, unfortunately, early euthanasia. It is an unfortunate and sad disease seen in many breeds, especially common in Doberman and Great Dane. The first signs are usually seen at four to six years of age in Dobermans, but much younger in Great Danes. The owners typically see their dog become wobbly or uncoordinated. You may hear of cures such as feeding low calcium diet and acupuncture. But, none of these things have been proven to be of real benefit. Some wobblers' dogs can be managed on steroids and restricted activity, but the only real cure is a spine surgery called modified dorsal laminectomy. It is a surgical procedure of the spine, which aims to provide access to a prolapsed disc and therefore relieve pressure on the spinal cord. This surgery can take place only once the location of the trouble spot is known. This procedure is also used for dogs with severe neurological damage to the hind limbs, bladder, or bowel, as a result of spinal cord compression. Dr. Larry Newman, a board-certified specialist and neurosurgeon in private practice at the Veterinary Referral Center, did this surgery on Tucker. It is an extremely delicate and precise operation. Special instruments are used to remove the tops of the affected vertebrae, which then decompress the spinal cord and allow it to function without the damaging pressure that will eventually cause pain and paralysis. Immediately after surgery it is important the dog has strict rest for a period of weeks, to allow swelling and inflammation to subside. The dog requires appropriate pain relief, and for those with impaired limb or bladder or bowel function. Nursing care is essential to prevent bed sores or urine scald. In the intermediate term, physiotherapy such as hydrotherapy, massage, and passive movement exercises can help to maintain muscle tone and aid recovery. This allows the muscle to reattach to the operative area. Today, Tucker is recovered and a happy healthy dog, who will live a normal life without worries of pain or paralysis. The cost of diagnostic scans is significant, at around $800 to $2,000. The surgical expertise and equipment needed means this is an expensive procedure and you should expect to pay anywhere between $1,500 and $6,000. It should also be borne in mind the dog may need intensive care for a few days following surgery, which costs around $600 per night. Since, the Tucker's owners had purchased pet insurance, the company paid 90% of the total cost and is a perfect example of how pet health insurance really pays. Tucker's owners caught these symptoms early and it was really helpful for both the veterinarian and the specialists to work together for a perfect outcome. This also demonstrates how early detection of any problem and the help of the whole veterinary care team is so important for the precise treatment and complete cure. Where there is a recognized predisposition to disc disease, such as in the dachshund, the owner should avoid activities which place strain on the back. In addition, at the first indication of back pain the dog should be strictly rested and given pain relief. Dogs that show signs of numbness on the back end, such as staggering, weakness, or poor coordination, should be rested and see a vet as soon as possible in order to receive appropriate therapy and limit damage. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear an ophthalmologist called Dr. Ralph Peterson giving a presentation. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Ralph Peterson. I'm an ophthalmologist and a specialist in photochemistry. I will be talking about the genetic model and how does it fit in optometry. 
Well, genetics is being incorporated into medical care in terms of dealing with disease and specifically in one of the really critical areas of pre-symptomatic evaluation, or in other words, it's being able to intervene before the symptoms. The advantage of that, of course, is that you delay the onset of the disease and then, when it once manifests, you can delay the progression hopefully, and also decrease the severity, and things like that. So, this is already being done and interestingly ocular disease represents really a better sort of venue, so to speak than systemic disease, because there are a whole bunch of ocular diseases that result from a single mutation in one codon. Lots of these systemic diseases like heart disease, hypertension, diabetes and other things, the genetic contribution is very complex. There are multiple genes and multiple sites, and there are all sorts of complications and complexities in terms of applying that to actual clinical care. Even though it will be done, but it will take a longer period of time. There are all these studies going on like the Thousand Genomes Project. The genomics is already being applied in terms of ocular disease. I read a paper where they were looking at mutations in rhodopsin. If the mutation occurs in that area, it tremendously affects how rhodopsin responds to light. It does so because the rhodopsin to respond abnormally and it does result in disease. But it's not quite as drastic as in the first sign. We were able to show this with standard measurements that one would do in a clinical setting such as visual acuity, visual field diameter, dark at that sensitivity, ERG amplitude. But, it's not something that optometry is identified with. There are two categories. The first category is genetic testing, useful in terms of the things that I mentioned. I think the second issue is in terms of optometrists dealing with ocular disease. The public recognizes optometrists as being viable health care providers in terms of ocular disease, and I feel now this entire thing could be in jeopardy if optometrists don't get involved with genetics. When someone presented with some sort of ocular disease, we are already at the five-year point. It's not a question of you know if this happens, it's a question of when it's going to happen. Okay, I have no idea when it's going, but it's going to happen and optometrists are completely unprepared for this. So what does that mean? Let's say you know some point, that's what the ophthalmologists start to do. You know, in other words, you go in for an exam for an ocular disease and they will draw blood and send it out for genetic analysis, and optometrists aren't doing this. So in terms of the public perception, what does that mean? So in my mind, it's sort of analogous to, let's say you going to your internist for your yearly checkup and the person not drawing blood, to do, let's say a lipid profile, so who's going to continue to go to such a person? Most of the ophthalmologists are doing genetic testing and helping patients with that. In fact, I think just about everybody involved in ocular disease in the ophthalmology community is doing this as part of standard care routine. As I said, there are a few optometrists here and there who are doing it. But, it's not something that is recognized universally in optometry and, more importantly, as I said, we're not training students to get involved in this area. In terms of the mundane aspects, including insurance, I think there are three things in general that are happening, that are pushing genetic testing more and more into clinical care, ocular as well as as otherwise. One is that the amount of money it costs to do the analysis is coming way down. The second thing is the length of time it takes to do an analysis is speeding up very significantly, and perhaps most importantly, the insurance companies are starting to cover the tab because they are beginning to realize that it will cost them less in the long run. So these are all important issues that are driving genetic testing into a standard medical care. Now, both nutrition and genetics are becoming part of issues that are important in terms of ocular disease and specifically in age-related macular degeneration. So, one of the things that has happened just over the last couple of years is some models have been set up which look at a bunch of different factors, including genetics, environmental, diet, nutrition, demographic and ocular factors that can predict how likely it is that someone is going to develop AMD and once it develops what the likely progression characteristics are going to be. But again, showing you how both these areas are becoming vital in terms of dealing with ocular disease concludes it.
That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.